welcome back to episode number 26 of What's New with Mead. Today, I'm here with Sarah from Flora Brewing to chat about beer and some mead things and honey and everything. Welcome, Sarah. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So I want to first start off by uh, having you talk a little bit about your channel, about you and your brewing experience so that people can kind of get to know you. Yeah. Um, well, it all kind of started with Instagram. I like started home brewing because I got my husband a kit and he was not interested, even though he loves drinking beer. Mm -hmm. So I became the house brewer and uh, I started posting stuff on Instagram. It just kind of blew up. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I started a YouTube channel, Flora Brewing, and it's just kind of educational, how to brew, brew days, recipes. I like build a recipe a week basically now um that it's just kind of out of the air uh, and i'm uh, currently in the process of starting my own podcast uh brewing after hours with sarah flora so yeah it's just kind of like organically grown and uh it's now taking over my life fully i just went part-time at my full-time job uh -huh. so <laughs> to fully dedicate my life to beer <laughs> um yeah so you know it's just kind of a hobby that's slowly becoming my entire life that's like the best place to be though when you can start to put other things on the side and say here i am let's just brew full time i mean that is like that's a dream for sure oh yeah it's i'm like pinching myself every day it's crazy <laughs> that i'm allowed to do this so i'm like how how am i an adult and doing this and like not having a nine-to-five job and it's really scary but it's fun uh-huh Absolutely. So how long, maybe I missed it. How long have you been brewing beer? When was like the first uh, beer brewing experience for you? Um, I think it was July, 2014. I want to say maybe 2015, five years. Okay. Yeah. It's, you know, time is nothing <laughs> doesn't exist anymore. Especially during COVID. <laughs> okay, cool. So you've been doing it for five or six years. Have you, um, found yourself going towards any specific style in all this time or are you just kind of grabbing everything going for it? Um, you know, I started out trying to make IPAs cause that's what I was drinking. Um, as I got a little disillusioned with IPAs, I started doing a lot of fruit beers, um, which uh -huh. I absolutely love. It's, I feel like it's kind of hard to screw up a fruit beer and I think <laughs> that's why I, uh, gravitate towards them. Uh -huh. um, but I also love just pulling out beers that I've never even tried from the beer judge certification program site. Um, they're like style guidelines. Mm -hmm. So I've done a Kentucky common and Australian sparkling ale that way. And mm -hmm. they turned out to be two of my favorite beers I've ever brewed. Now that I have a glycol system, I'm focusing a lot more on lagers and it just happens to be, that's what I want to drink now. I'm like kind of burnt out on IPAs. Mm -hmm. I think it's mainly because I can't nail the NEPA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just like, ah, oh, I got to get it. But at the same time, I'm just like, but I know I can make great lagers easily yeah. that I want to drink. So, you know, it's just like kind of whatever a whim is at the point with okay. me making a recipe and yeah absolutely so have you within all your time brewing have you found yourself refining a certain recipe or doing anything in that regard or are you kind of like i my problem is that i've made so much stuff now that i have like two or three things that i'm like actively trying to nail down but i'm also just like grabbing at straws making everything i can yeah, you know, I should I should be refining the recipes. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of set myself up for failure in that arena because I'm with the YouTube channel. I try to make a new recipe and do a brand new brew day like three times a month or so. Uh -huh. um, so I I'm just it's more trying to nail down like the NEPA style in general. I haven't been able to fully figure out exactly how to do it but i think my problem was i was over hopping everything so it is a learning curve for sure you just got to make as much as you can and <laughs> pick what's good and figure out what you did right at that point and absolutely yeah figure out what you did wrong and the ones that don't turn out and then force yourself to drink them so that you <laughs> remember not to do it again <laughs> yeah so with so with how much you brew are you um are you giving away a lot of stuff or are you just i mean 
like I feel like I have so much stuff I have to give it away otherwise I will be 400 pounds next week so oh, yeah like we drink a lot of beer honestly it's like really embarrassing we buy a lot of beer still really um, <laughs> um that's not a bad but, thing uh, yeah I end up trying to can like half of every batch and give it away to friends and like I did a bunch right before my move and mm -hmm. uh, now I'm just like kicking myself. I'm like, well, now I don't have any beer. <laughs> I, I just threw in a couple of kegs that I made right before the move that I haven't really um, gotten a chance to fully appreciate yet. One I haven't even mm -hmm. tasted at all. And it's a HBC 431 hop single pale, single hop pale ale. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to try it. I think I'm going to crack it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I definitely, um, I, I want to get into the, the canning talk, like talking about canning in a little bit, because I also think that'll be interesting for um, us mead making people. I, that's something I've investigated, um, but I don't want to go down that rabbit hole just yet. So I do want to talk, kind of open up the, the gates of hops and, and talk about the wide world that is hops and, and speci uh, excuse me, specifically beer, but I think mead, um, I have had quite a few hopped meads and been really impressed by them. And I think using them in mead is a bit of a different animal. Most of the time we are like uh, dry hopping. I, I don't know many mead recipes that are starting off with hops. Um, but can you tell us about, well, you've used a lot of hops. Do you have any that are your standards? Any that you are like, these are my go-to no matter what. Yeah, I mean, everyone loves Simcoe Mosaic blend. That mm -hmm. has always been my go-to. The best IPA I make is a Simcoe Mosaic. And, um, you know, I, uh, I end up getting a lot of hops from Yakima Valley and Yakima Chief to try out, like a lot of their um, experimental ones. So, mm -hmm. like the HBC 431, that's the first time I'm using it. It's an experimental hop that's supposed to be really melony. But one of my favorites is HBC 586, and it is like straight mango. It Ooh. is so nice. It's delicious. And Mose it's, it's pretty similar to Mosaic in that it has that super mango-y character, but it's way more like fruit salad mango versus mm. Mosaic can be a little grassy, I think. Um, so those, of course, um, you know, Cascade. Cascade's just like, everyone loves it. Right. It's uh -huh. It's a perfect top. It's really hard to screw up with Cascade. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but those are the few things that I try to keep around and use as much as possible. But, you know, I also am like, I'm making German lagers. I love German lagers <laughs> right now. So I'm like using German Magnum and Halerta Blanc and some Saz and, you know, just your noble yeah. German hops kind of situation. So within that, you... Um, are there any that you've like tried that well, I, I don't want to put it in the spot to shame anybody, but is there anything that you've tried that people have been like, this is like the best one and you haven't been as impressed with, you know what I mean? Like um, I well, I, I know a lot of people feel this way, so it's not like everyone loves it, but, yeah. uh, galaxy, I, mm. I use it frequently, but I don't want to, it straight up smells like cat pee to me. <laughs> And it's, it's a really specific hop and um, it works really well in the bittering phase, but like, I don't dry hop with it. Cause I'm like, I don't want that aromatic to come through in the beer. Cause I think it's gross, but it does make really good beers it, used in bittering additions. So, you know, it's a, you got to weigh your options with these kinds of things. Okay. Yeah. So um, on that topic, you, you talked about, using them in dry hopping. So what would you say, let's say we're using the Simcoe hops, for example. Um, what are some concerns of using or differences of using Simcoe in the primary versus dry hopping post fermentation? What do you, when do you see, or what do you see the differences being? Um, so if you're using it in a primary, like typically, um, well, when you're using hops in the boil, it's typically for bittering. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you add your hops post-boil in what you might consider the primary, you can actually, um, there's this whole process called biotransformation that if you add your hops when you are in high fermentation, it 
uh, basically the yeast and the hops have a reaction and it's supposed to create super juicy uh, flavor and aroma. Um, okay. And even more so than if you were to dry hop after fermentation, something about it just livens up the flavor. Hmm. Um, so you, a lot of people use those for New England IPAs. And this is something that I'm like trying yeah. to figure out for my New England IPAs. Um, but it's, it's the same thing with dry hopping. Like you're going to get more aroma. You're going to get more of like the, what you get in an IPA, like a face full of hops when you smell it. And then mm -hmm. like the high fruitiness versus bittering, like in the, if you put it in the boil, it, the boil itself, uh, I summarizes the alpha acids and it creates the bitterness that you uh -huh. associate with beer. So it balances the sweetness of the malt by becoming bitter. Interesting. So um, you said if you put them in during that primary stage po while it's fermenting, is there a certain point? Have you found like passing the two thirds sugar break or is it like you got to wait till one third? Like where you, where do you normally add them? Do you high Krausen? I'm not quite sure what <laughs> I feel like <laughs> this is where meat and beer differs. Yeah. Like we talk high Krausen uh -huh. versus you're doing your sugar breaks. Um, but you know, it's usually like two, three days into fermentation that mm -hmm. it'll happen. You know, you're just looking for like that high foam on top of the beer mm -hmm. Um, and you just, at that point, you just know the yeast is super active, super happy. It's not in the lag phase anymore. And it's just multiplying and keeping going and fermenting out. And that's when you should add it for biotransformation. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's true. There's a lot of terminology that <laughs> beer, beer and mead are definitely different. I, I forgot about that. Um, I'm so stuck in the mead world that I was like, I didn't even think about that difference. <laughs> So, um, and developing your palate for hops, have you found that it is more of an experiential thing in that you're just trying a bunch of different hops or are you going off some grandmaster list of hops in the world and aromatics? Like where do you generally find most information about them? Um, well, you know, I go, I go off like whatever the company is that sent me there, uh -huh. like you know, aroma compounds. They usually send these uh, triangle charts of like what aromas uh, their testers have picked up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it is also like, I try to seek out single hop beers. So that's a good way to train your palate to know exactly what that hop tastes like to you because it might taste different to you than it does to whatever tester wrote the triangle test. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, it, I mean, it's, sometimes it's hard to find single hop beers, um, but you know, you can always make them yourself, which is <laughs> what I'm doing with the HBC 431. Yeah. Um, but you know, I also like, I'm on message boards all the time when I'm trying to create a new recipe and figure out what other people are experiencing when they use this specific hop. Okay. Well, and I, I kind of asked that because whenever I, I went into the brew shop, two months ago, whatever. And I was looking up buying some hops and I don't do it very often. And so I was looking at the list and it was just like miles long. And I felt like, I was like, what the heck do I even choose? And of course, you know, if you have the idea, I want something orange esque, then I'm going to go down this rabbit hole. But just as a general, if you have no idea what you're doing and you want to buy a hop, you're kind of like, Oh man, oh, this yeah. is <laughs> crazy. <laughs> When I first started, um, I, I like how I build recipes is I like have a idea of what I want the end flavor to be. Mm -hmm. So say I'm making like a tangerine wheat beer mm -hmm. and I want to complement the tangerine with some hops that have orange aroma. I would just search hops with orange, orange aroma or orange flavor or like hops that taste like orange. I'm, I'm like on Google all the time. That's how... I live my life. I'm like, I couldn't do anything without Google at this point. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. I mean, other people have already done the work for you. You don't need to like go and try all these hops. You can mm -hmm. get a pretty good idea of what you're going to get in the end just by looking up what even just the companies are saying about what the hops are going to deliver. Yeah. So within that, you, you're talking about some different I'm going to call them beer communities because they're probably more beer related. Are there any major ones you point people to as the biggest helpers? Like, do you go to Reddit? Do you use Facebook? Like where's, where do you get your knowledge? 
I'm like totally off Facebook. I, mm. I live on Reddit. It's okay. my happy place. Um, but yeah, the our home brewing, And then also, um, I really like the site Brew Your Own for um, mm. looking up how to build recipes. So you can, if you Google like how to build a like Irish red recipe, they usually have a guide and it's, they'll have a recipe in there, but they'll also tell you exactly like what you should be looking for when you're building your own recipe. So hmm. you need uh, like this percentage of like caramel malts, this percentage of base malt, um, try to stick to like this region of hops or like, hops that have like this kind of alpha acid or this kind of flavor compounds. And um, it's really helpful, um, especially if you're just like building something that you've never built before and don't have a great I understanding of what the beer should actually taste like. Mm -hmm. There's also great resources at um, the bjcp.org. That's the beer judge certification program. They mm -hmm. have style guidelines for everything. And from their style guidelines, you can basically figure out how to make a beer to match those guidelines. Interesting. Okay. I've always wondered, obviously the mead world, Reddit is a big one, of course. And then I am on Facebook and that's one of my places, but um, there's communities there. So I just think it's good to point in the direction of anybody who wants to find information that that's a good place oh, yeah. to go. There's so many resources out there. It's insane. It's, it's yeah. great. The internet's a I wonderful like, place. <laughs> oh, I know. And uh, I think when I started, I was like always on Brewer's Friend because that was like the big one at the time. And also, if you're wondering about a specific variable in your beer that could be doing something weird go to brewlosophy they do mm -hmm. like mythbusters level experiments um and i'm absolutely obsessed with them their podcast oh, is awesome too and i'm just like marshall shot be my friend <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i would love to well, i love to do the mythbusters ideas in the mead world and i'm nowhere near their capabilities they they're freaking geniuses so i can't I can't believe how much content they put out. It's mind blowing. Yeah, it's incredible. I would love to be able to do that, but also I feel like I got to get at least a few years older, you know, a little bit more knowledge before I can get to that point. So yeah. um, they're just absolutely incredible. So I also want to, uh, on the topic of hops, I want to ask you about the longevity of flavor profiles. So when you put hops into a brew, regardless of primary, during the primary, you know, dry hopping, have you found that there's a certain point where that hop flavor decays uh, a lot? Or is it, are they pretty consistent about staying around for a long time? Um, so you're always supposed to drink beer fresh like mm -hmm. unless it's a barrel aged kind of situation, but like IPAs, you're always supposed to drink fresh. And there's a very specific reason for that. And it is that hops drop out. Mm -hmm. They, the flavor drops out like in a couple months, if you try a IPA, like as soon as it's ready and then try it a couple months, it'll be significantly less bitter and less hop forward. I brewed an IPA on my 30th birthday. Mm -hmm. That was, very, very hoppy, like too hoppy, if I'm going to be honest. Um, and so I saved some cans. And when I was moving, like last month, I found some of these cans and we opened it up. It turned from a extremely hoppy IPA to a very malt forward kind of pale ale mm -hmm. kind of situation. And it's delightful. So I always recommend like if you over hop a beer, just let it sit around for a while and it'll fall out. It'll definitely mellow and the malt will come forward in the end. That's funny you say that. So knowing that I was going to talk about beer tonight, I poured some of my beers that I've made. And one of them is this down under IPA kit I bought because I was, I'm a lazy beer brewer, honestly. And it used, um, what's the, it used Montezuka hops and New Zealand Sticklebract, which I guess are two, I don't know. Anyways, when I bottled it, it was so hoppy. I mean, I, I was like, I couldn't drink it. I was like, this is mm -hmm. terrible. It's been three or four months and I'm drinking some, some now and, it's like, like you said, the hop profile has dissipated and so much that it is very much so pale. Like, it's pretty interesting. I was a little worried that it would never go away being yeah. as strong as it was, but I guess it's true. You know, there's 
everything eventually falls out or melds over time in brewing. Yeah. I'm a big believer in like, if you don't like beer, just let it sit for like six months and then try it later. And if it's still not good, maybe toss it out. But man, I just did a video on my YouTube of three to four year old beers that I just stashed, stashed away that I was like finding when I moved and three out of four were not good, Mm -hmm. but there was this blueberry sour that was just like, to die for. <laughs> Do you feel like you have to get them to a certain ABV point for them to actually age well? Because like mead, you know, you most things that are like seven, eight percent, they'll keep for a while, but eventually that goes away. So like if you want to age a mead for a long time, you're having to look at 10 plus percent for it to last three, four, five years plus. That's Is that the same for I- beer? Have you noticed anything like that? That blue sour, blueberry sour was only 5%. Really? Um, okay. And I think the IPA was, was probably six or seven. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I'm not intentionally aging them. I'm not brewing them to age them. Uh, mm-hmm. If I were brewing them to age them, like I, I've done, uh, I have a double recipe that I age for about a month and a half before I even open the first one. Um, just because it mellows out lovely. Mm-hmm. It's based on Ninkasi's uh, Tricer- Tricer hops. No, Total Domination. Mm. Such a good beer. Um, yeah, so as long as you're sanitary when you're packaging, it, it can technically last forever. Okay, um, yeah. I, I hesitate to say forever, but... <laughs> <laughs> you're good. <laughs> um, really, honey is the only thing that lasts forever. Yes. Um, yeah, so... You know, I think as long as you're sanitary, and it's going to be fine. So it those, smells weird when you open it up. Don't drink it. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, if it smells dangerous, stay away. Were those beers um, canned or were they bottled? Um, some of them were canned. Some of one, I think one was canned, two were bottled, and the blueberry sour was in a keg. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it been in a keg so, yeah, for that long? I aged it in a keg for Holy three cow. years. Holy cow. I was that just is, being lazy and didn't want to dump it. Well, I mean, that's awesome. <laughs> like, man, I, uh, uh, I wish one goal for me is to get a kegging system at some point because, um, everything I do that's uh, carbonated is bottle carved, which has its own advantages and also has a ton of disadvantages. Cause you're just like praying that nothing explodes. Um, of course there's math to keep you from exploding, but you know, just depending on what you do. So, uh, I would love you to be able carbonate to carbonate mead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, That's absolutely. Cool. So the there's a style called a hydromel, which hydromel and lots of other languages means mead. But for us here in the U.S. and other places, it's a mead that is 7.5% ABV or lower. And lots of times those are carbonated because when you get that light, unless you are really adding body filling things, um, it just turns watery, even with carbonation. Yeah. So uh, most of the time, I've found that uh, hydromels are are carbonated and lots of people will do them of course kegged and when they have the availability um i just don't have that i've got a little one gallon keg it's this little dinky like i mean it it works decently but it's not great so i definitely would like to be able to carbonate more because it is nice especially during oh, some, yeah. to have something low abv and carbonated oh yeah and on tap mm. <laughs> i need a kegerator that's what i really need so <laughs> Yeah, I gotta, yeah, I gotta convince I my just, fiance to let me get a kegerator at some point. We'll figure that out. Yeah, <laughs> I just plugged mine in last night. It's in the garage, and like, I, I shouldn't have, but I was like, shit, I gotta carbonate this beer. <laughs> um, but yeah, I force carb everything. It's so easy. It's oh, awesome. Yeah. I would recommend anybody listening if you have the availability to do it, switch over just because you have more control. There's a lot of variables with. Um, if you can stabilize a mead and I'm sure a beers can be the same way. If you want the beer to be sweeter for some reason and you need to add more sugar, whatever, um, you don't have to go down the non fermentable sugar route, which lots of people don't even like to touch that because it's, it's not as real quote. So that's what I'd recommend yeah. at least. Yeah. Lactose definitely gives like a body that is unmistakable. Mm-hmm. So kind of bizarre. Have you barrel aged any beers in your time? I haven't. I actually don't like barrel aged beer. Really? Okay. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I'm not about it. There's something like 
I, I find most of them are very syrupy mm -hmm. and uh, I really, really enjoy beers on the lighter side, like crispy lagers, low ABV. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a small person. I don't get to drink much beer. If it's <laughs> heavy. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Oh man. So in that regard, um, have you found a style or a beer that you would recommend a new beer brewer to start with? Obviously everybody has their preferences and some people like whatever IPAs and some people like stouts, but is there a good entry level beer to begin with? Saison's or Belgian styles. Okay. Um, and here's my reasoning. So what most beginning home brewers lack is temperature control. The nice thing about Saison's and Belgian styles is that works in your favor. So you get more phenolics because the yeast is fermenting warmer and Belgian strains and Saison strains can usually handle a higher temperature of mm -hmm. fermentation. So that's what um, I basically, well, I made my first Belgian like last, this summer, this summer, I guess, <laughs> I don't know. But <laughs> um, it, it's, they're just awesome. And the, f the flavor that I don't like when I make an IPA and it ferments too warm is the flavor you're looking for when you're doing a Belgian style. So it's, it's the super phenolic, the super clovey um, aroma. And yeah, they're, you know, they're easy to do. There's not like a lot of dry hopping. Saison's you can throw anything into and it'll be great. I made a Saison for Valentine's Day a couple years ago that we literally threw like every edible flower we could find in and it, hmm. it just ended up tasting like sage. I'm Interesting. Like, All right, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Huh. When did you put those in? Um, did you put them in that primary or did you wait to try and preserve aromas? The, we put them in the boil. Okay. Um, and then I did a tea of hibiscus and added it after just to up the pink color more. We also added rose water and orange water to it. Mm. And there was some roseberry in the boil. Um, there was like a lot of stuff in there. Butterfly yeah. pea flower. We were kind of trying to make it purple, but it didn't pan out. It's more of like a rusty red uh-huh did you taste yeah. the wart before it fermented and did you notice yeah, any I difference okay <laughs> oh yeah i wondered about that i i um i don't think i have either but knowing that i feel like i'd just be curious to see the change obviously like mead it's just a super sweet thing so it doesn't yeah. really i mean it's just pure sugar but i feel like the wart it's gonna have some sweetness but a lot of character possibly it's it's pretty freaking sweet it's uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you're probably starting to i mean assuming you're doing lighter beers like you said you're probably starting at what 10 40 to, to 10 50 on average is that like your starting point yeah 10 i my problem is like i always like try to do lower and then i like can't make myself make a beer that's under five percent <laughs> <laughs> so like 10 50 10 60 is okay. probably my standard and then i keep overshooting my efficiency because i have my system, di system dialed in, but I have not changed my Brewfather app to make my efficiency correct in it. So mm. I'm like constantly going like a couple points over. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, well, higher alcohol beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Less is more. That's, I mean, that's kind of nice. Um, so w within equipment, I'm curious, is there anything that like I'll, put, I'll do two things. One, for you personally, is there a dream piece of equipment that you want to own eventually? Is there something in that regard? Yes. I want a like eight keg keezer that opens from the front more Ooh. than anything. Um, we're like trying to figure out how to build it, but it's like, yeah. the thing is I don't want to lift kegs above the lip mm. and you know, I, but I want it to be wide and I'm like literally like, should we like make our own like refrigerator or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've seen a lot of people do that. That's, that seems to be a, a common thing. Yeah, yeah, because my kegerator only ho holds three kegs and I've got nine. Mm -hmm. I'm just like constantly having to like swap them. And then I'm like, well, now I can't can this because it's I swapped it. Now it's room temperature, so I got to swap it back to mm. can it to get 
keg cleans and you know it's just dosy doing and it's unnecessary <laughs> yeah no i understand that so what would you say um for a beer brewer let's assume that this person is like me you know doesn't have a kegging system doesn't have um much extra things would you put like the kegging system as like priority number one or is there another piece of equipment you would say this is more important than a kegging system so the one piece of equipment that has changed my brewing and made it exponentially better is a glycol system. Mm -hmm. Granted, that is not accessible for everyone and <laughs> not a beginner piece of equipment. They're expensive. Uh -huh. um, but being able, I mean, you could also build a keyser for less money and kind of make it a fermentation chamber. But mm -hmm. anything having to do with temperature control is what I would suggest, mm -hmm. even before kegging, because like, if you're not making good beer because you're not keeping it under like 80 degrees, which I mean, I'm in Southern California, so this is a constant problem. Um, yeah. it, it gets 120 degrees in the Valley. So that's where I'm at. Jeez. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, that's, I mean, from personal experience, that is key unless you have like, you know, a cellar that you could keep your beer in and stuff. But like, I've never, had a basement in my entire life so right. i'm like basements weird me out a bit right. um i'm just like what is this and is it part of your square footage like i just don't understand um but yeah it's i mean i think it's just so important because you've got to start with good beer before you're gonna want to like package the beer if mm -hmm. you're, you know and i like we've all been in the situation where you like pop a beer and you're just like this is and I spent so much time on it and, <laughs> you know, and I like, I honestly haven't made a terribly crappy beer since I got a glycol system, unless I forgot to turn on the glycol system. Uh -huh. <laughs> I have a, my little attempt at that is a deep freezer, which is currently being a freezer because once COVID hit, I was like, I got to stock up. And so I had to convert it back. But just with one of those temperature controllers. Yeah, and, one of the ink birds. Yeah, but I mean, I'm in Oklahoma and yeah, we have hot summers and things, but I keep my house like 68 to 70 on average. And so like most of the time my fermentations aren't going too crazy. And most wine yeast have at least a decent enough um, temperature range that they do fine. Yeah. Um, I'm not hitting any low end and I'm not really hitting the hot end of things. So, but I would agree. I think that temperature control especially, you know, being in Southern California is so important. You could never make a good beer if you can't control how hot or cold yeah, your fermentation seriously. is. And in that little apartment, like we just had the window unit ACs. Mm -hmm. we could, I couldn't keep the brewery less than 80 degrees, even in the winter. So it, in December, when my, when I forgot to turn my glycol on, when I was making my Christmas beer, it got 85 degrees in there. Oh, geez. In December. <laughs> And like, granted, the kegerator's in there, so it's pushing out some heat. And yeah, like, yeah. we have our computers in there, so they're also hot. But mm -hmm. it's like, it's just yeah, that's like, that's up there. <laughs> so crazy. let's talk about um, canning. I'm curious. You're a big you can a lot of things, which for me is really interesting. I uh, had a big kick about three months ago, and I almost ordered a, a canning seamer and did that stuff. Because I was like, man, I'm so tired of bottles. Like bottles are nice, but I never get my bottles back when I give them to people, you know, <laughs> and cans are cheap if you buy them in bulk, at least from what I'm finding. So About 50 cents a can, which I, I would be comfortable spending. I mean, it's still money like, but I, it's. For me, it's easier. When I do get bottles back, it's nice, but then I have to, of course, delabel them because nobody, nobody ever soaks them or anything like that. So there's like, it's cost benefit. You know, am I gonna, I'll spend, I'll spend 50 cents on a can to not have to spend 48 hours delabeling this and then the hour to do it all, all hundred oh, yeah. bottles I get. So um, within canning, are is there a, a cheap way to get into canning or are you having to go in and just, bite the bullet i think you're probably gonna spend a thousand dollars no matter what you get really? um hmm. just like with equipment your first set of cans um 
beer gun of some sort. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have the cannular can seamer. Um, I got off more beer. And I think it was $500. I don't know. I have the pro one sitting in my garage now. Uh I think that's $649 or something. Um, But, yeah, in 200 cans is like $99. Mm -hmm. And then a beer gun is $99. So, Eh, maybe 800 yeah. or so but yeah you know it's an investment and i i mean i like it i there's novelty in it which i really enjoy yeah. i actually got this um counter pressure can filler from great fermentations too that is Ooh. awesome it's like kind of a set it and forget it you can just like let it fill and it'll Ooh, like slow that's itself nice. down it's like hands-free and i'm all about it and it's way cleaner than like you know we you want to fill up to um so that there's foam at the very tip of the lid. You always can on foam to prevent um, oxygen. Mm-hmm. And like with, when you're using the beer gun, you kind of have to overflow it a bit. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's just a mess. You end up losing more beer if you use um, that kind of system. So, yeah, I switched to the Great Fermentations. It's like called Tap Cooler. It's really cool. Big fan. Yeah. So I definitely think I would love to get to there at some point just because I feel like canning's easier for me um do you do labels for your cans or are you just handwriting on there this is the you know whatever i am so lazy <laughs> i'm so busy yeah um, no, i don't doubt it. you make you know, a lot of things i do make a lot of things um i you know i, I so i'm from the art world i actually work at an art gallery and oh cool so um <laughs> it's i love making can labels and mm-hmm. but you know it's very time consuming i have made can labels and i've die cut them out and they're like awesome uh-huh. um but yeah it's like one of those things like i'm gonna give it away i may as well just write in sharpie no one gives yeah. a shit <laughs> exactly yeah no it's fair especially well i think that's important to um, not that people can't do that, but there is some sketchy factor to me. If, if my buddy were to just come up and give me a random bottle of booze with, you know, what a blueberry beer on the side, if I didn't know him super well, I'd be like, Hmm, I don't really know about this, but you being a, um, notoriously famous brewer, I think people are going to be like, ah, that's fine. Yeah. If I've had her stuff. So the, no one's I, turned it away yet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, no one turns away free booze. That's the, the reality <laughs> of it. Everybody wants free booze. And um, I mean, there are some people who will come back and give you honest feedback. But most of the time, people are like, hey, that's good. And then waiting for yeah. the next batch. Yeah. Usually it's people asking for beer or my husband being like, so and so needs beer. Please <laughs> can some really quick. And I'm like, I have to go to work in 15 minutes. What are you talking <laughs> about? <laughs> Have you ever thought about doing growlers and just like having people return those? Yeah, I actually have a buddy who homebrews like up the street and I'm like, we need to take a growler, leave a growler system because yeah. he'll always bring me like random bottles and I'm just giving him my growlers. And I was like, you have like five of my growlers at your house. Can you just like bring them back so I can give you more <laughs> beer? <laughs> yeah. No, I think that that's like probably the easiest way. I feel like, especially if they're repeat people, so to speak, you know, then oh, yeah. they, you know, they're going to come back around. So just. Yeah. The and if they're not going to keep it around, they're going to drink it immediately. Uh huh. Yeah. I would, uh, I need to convert to some of that. I do a lot of like single bottles and I- I'm getting more lazy. I do a lot of sub labels of my own, but, um, that's mainly, that was mainly to start giving to people. Now I give it to the same people. So I think if I just did simple labels, they wouldn't even bat an eye at it. It's yeah. just a starter point. Um, but who knows? I just, it's something else. So let's talk about a little bit about um, your experience. Obviously, you've tasted honey. You've done those things. I know we talked a little bit about your experience with honey. Can you give me um, – I just tell us your experience within honey trying or anything like that. So uh, I've never brewed with honey, but mm-hmm. my stepdad is a beekeeper, and I'm always trying to convince him to send me enough honey to brew with. And it has not happened yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like, at this point, I'm like, any honey you like don't like, just send all of it to me, please. Mm-hmm. Um, 
But yeah, I've done some research on honey. I actually like our, my homebrew club put on a really awesome lecture about um, brewing with honey. Good. And you know, if you put it in the boil, it lightens the body. It's, it acts like any other sugar. So it, it basically behaves the same mm-hmm. as, uh, you know, table sugar. And you kind of lose a lot of the flavor and aroma care, like of the honey itself. But if you add it after fermentation, um, a lot more is retained. So you can mm-hmm. actually, I think it's like up to 10%, you get a light honey flavor if you add it after fermentation. And I think it'll ferment out again. Um, but for some reason, it's supposed to stick around a lot longer. I think because boiling just like, you know, releases all of the compounds mm-hmm. of the aroma and everything. And it, you know, it kind of denatures it. But I was looking into pasteurizing honey and there's, then, you know, there's a lot yeah. of things because honey is a very um, thick with organisms. And yes, whatnot. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and though it is back antibacterial itself, it, mm-hmm. when you add it to a medium that is basically all sugar, those organisms uh, can take off. So you kind of yeah. got to pasteurize it before you use it. So yeah, that's definitely in my future. I'm hoping to get some honey beers made mm-hmm. this year. I actually, one of the guys in my homebrew club makes this avocado honey beer. Oh yeah. Probably one of the best beers I've ever drunk. That's one of my favorite types of honey. I love avocado Easy. blossom honey. It is wildly good. Mm-hmm. And it's so simple and just like, it's just lovely. I love it. I think the challenge with using um, honey within a beer is like you said, the aromatic side, putting it in the boil and those things. But also like you do end up raising the gravity of your beer. And if you're somebody who wants to keep it low and keep it at 6%, you're going to have a really hard time keeping that beer below whatever that is, 10, 40. Um, Just because like honey is obviously very sugary. And I guess you could replace your malt, but then you're competing and saying, is this still a beer? Like, I don't have well, as much malt. I have more honey. I'm now I'm kind of in, in the territory of a, a bracket is what yeah, we call it's it. Like 30% is a bracket or something. Yeah. Which yeah. that's a big debatable thing. A lot of people say if it has, some people are on the camp. If it has any honey in it, it's more of a bracket. And then other people are saying it has to be 51% honey as the fermentable sugar for it to be a bracket. Oh, wow. So it's just like, everybody's got an opinion. We're all just trying to figure out what's real at this point in that regard. But what honey, are the rules? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just, I don't know. That's, it's interesting. Um, but I find that, well, I've made one, two braggots now. And the first one I did was like a blackberry braggot and it ended up being like 11%, which is a, pretty hot beer. I mean, that's, that's pretty high up there, but it was very fascinating. Like I said, using the honey in the boiling process, how it changed, um, the body of it in my head, I was like, man, this is going to be fuller bodied and it's going to be like just amazing. And it, it becomes more watery. It's just a little wild to me. And I do know that it obviously changes the volume of the liquid and the sugars ferment in their own different way. But um, I find that, of course, I love honey being a mead maker. That's like, <laughs> I, that's just where I'm at. Honestly, it's hard not to like honey. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's just like, how could you not? Man, Texas wildflower honey, hard to beat. So are you, you're talking about wanting to do more and I don't, I don't want you to spoil any recipes you have coming up, but I'm curious if you could use one type of honey, are you going to go, are you going to go and try and find avocado blossom? Or are you going to stick with the Texas wildflower? What are you going to do? Um, honestly, I'm cheap. So <laughs> yeah. I'll stick with, um, yeah. So my stepdad's in Texas, uh-huh. uh, just like South of San Antonio. And, um, I mean, the bees are probably really unhappy in the middle of snow right now, uh-huh. but uh, <laughs> um, I would probably stick with them. They have tons of mesquite trees there, which Ooh, are, it's the, it's the best honey I've ever had. Mm-hmm. And um, they, they live on my grandma's ranch now and they've always had beekeepers putting bees on their property since Ooh, I was yeah. a kid. And it's always just been the best honey. It There's something about it. It's just mm-hmm. like 
I think it's like my childhood. I think is why I like well, it. Well, it's also really good. I love mesquite honey. It's I'm a big whiskey guy, and so the smokiness you get from mesquite in general and that honey is just it's fantastic. So those two are my favorite. You've actually said avocado blossom and mesquite are like up there as my all time. Yeah. If I could just buy pails and pails. Well, if you're looking to buy honey and you're trying to get it for cheaper, uh, if you find one you like, buying bulk is definitely a lot cheaper. It's yeah. expensive. I think that the the buy-in for beer can be expensive for people, but it's definitely cheaper than mead. Um, you know, I, I'm sitting next to 60 pounds of blueberry honey right now, and that cost me like, uh, what was it? About 220 bucks. Jesus. So it's it's mega expensive for sure. But if you learn how to use it well, you can mm-hmm. utilize it in a good way. So. Yeah. I'm sure it's the same way with brewing or with beer. Yeah. I mean, it is, uh, for, it depends on like how you're brewing too. If you're brewing all grain, you can make five gallons for like 30 bucks. Uh If you're brewing extract, it gets exponentially more expensive just Mm -hmm. because, you know, you're not doing the labor that the brewing is like, you're not doing the mash. So someone else has to do the mash and you're basically paying their labor. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, I think that's actually why I was scared off from honey for a while because I'm just like, oh my God, it's so expensive. I'm going to screw yeah. it up. I'm going to waste all this money. Seriously though. Oh, there's, I, I'm just now getting to the point where I feel comfortable buying expensive honey because I feel like I had to go through so many phases of like, well, that didn't work. That didn't work. And now I'm kind of getting closer to like, okay, this is working. I'll, I'll go and spend the money to buy that, the nice honey. But um it is a super interesting thing, and, and I definitely want to do more with beer and honey additives. I feel like I love getting to make beer. Um, I'm a big stout person. That's, like, one of my favorite things. Um, I don't know what got me into that, but it's uh, very um, – I guess it's just the route I chose. But I have a suggestion. Mm-hmm. You should brew The Black is Beautiful. Um, oh yeah i saw that in the store the other day i almost bought some but walmart was crazy so i was like i didn't go over and pick it up because i was like i'll lose my spot in line (laughs) yeah it's the best stout i've ever had or made really and yeah they have the recipe up um and i made i kind of made a variation of it and i have Mm -hmm. it up um you can find on my youtube um it is delightful it's so good i need to try it Uh, definitely that sounds fun to me i i'd love to uh I love to experiment with those things. And I definitely think that, uh, a, a, I want to do more stouts. This is, a uh, an oatmeal raisin cookies. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oatmeal raisin cookies stout. And, uh, it's, I use like raisin extract in it, which was kind of weird. i would oh, never used that before. I didn't even know that was a thing that they made yeah. raisin extract, but <laughs> I, I bought some, um, and I did end up adding some honey to it at some point. I can't remember what kind it's been a long time, but, uh, yeah, I would love to just get in that beer game. My problem is I have so much stuff going on behind me. I'm sure you know the same thing. Like being a YouTuber, having to constantly have stuff ready to post, you're probably updating four or five videos all the time at least. Oh, yeah. I have a lot going on. And I'm like so behind right now with the move. Yeah. I'm just like I recorded a video this morning and I was supposed to record one tonight, but uh, it it fell through with my uh my guest and i'm just like i'm honestly happy (laughs) yeah Yeah. no i understand well so i want to um i'll give you a second to plug all of your avenues i know you have a podcast coming out and i will of course be linking to that down below um i got to listen to the promo for it and i myself i must say i'm excited to get to hear it because i think it's going to be um very fun and fascinating for me and undoubtedly for other people where can we find and support you um so my youtube is just flora brewing my instagram flora underscore brewing uh, um my patreon is flora brewing and i post bonus content ad free videos i have merch like a lot of merch working on round two um and yeah if you want more of my stuff you can find it there Perfect. Podcast is Brewing After Hours with Sarah Flora. And honestly, it's been so fun to make. Mm -hmm. I uh, 
like you do, I get to interview awesome people. And um, yeah, it's just fascinating. And it's more about the history of beer than like technical side. Yeah. And I'm just like a total story person. I'm a true crime junkie too. <laughs> and <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I love stories. I love telling stories. And honestly, I love hearing stories more than anything. I could just like, I'm, I listen to podcasts all day long. It's mm-hmm. like my thing. Um, so yeah. And yeah, beer is fascinating. It's been here forever, like since mm-hmm. the dawn of time. So it's like, there's so much to dive into. That's awesome. So is that going to be available anywhere? Podcasts are available? Is anywhere. There... Perfect. Perfect. Anywhere. It's on the Believe Network and yeah, they're putting it everywhere. That is awesome. Well, we'll definitely, I'll be putting that down in the description if you're listening or watching this. Um, And of course, go check out her channel and things. Um, Thank you so much for your time. Like you said, I know you're real busy and I know that you you, you said it yourself. You could have been doing another video, but you stopped by and (laughs) and talked. And I I learned a lot and I got to have a lot of fun and undoubtedly my, hopefully my audience did. So uh, thank you for your time, Sarah. Yeah, this was super fun. I'm really excited to learn more about mead. I know nothing. Well, I, you know, if you ever need a bottle, I've got plenty. I'll send it your way. So that'd be great. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Have a good night. Thank you.